Good morning. I was thinking about beginnings and I remember when I came to Taiwan I arrived with one fairly large suitcase and one smaller more of a carry-on size suitcase and that was it and I remember arriving in the airport and not really having any plan. I'd come for a short stay. I hadn't booked any hotel. Just winging it, I guess. And I remember getting on the bus, figuring out, getting on the bus and getting to Taipei. And I remember the bus uh, that day dropping me off. The bus station was under construction, unbeknownst to me. And I got dropped off just as the day was ending, the night was beginning, dropped off on the side of the road in the rain. And I remember standing there, a little overwhelmed because coming from the airport, I got the last seat on the bus and it was crowded. And Everybody seemed to know where they were going, and I didn't have a plan. I certainly didn't plan on standing in the rain by the side of a busy road at rush hour with my suitcases, not knowing what was next. And I remember hearing someone say, Taxi? Uh, <laughs> and I said, yes. And fortunately for me, the taxi driver had some English. So he asked me where I was headed, and I said, I, I didn't know. I wanted to stay somewhere near the train station, somewhere near where I was, because my plan was to begin. I did have some plan. I wanted to go to Taroka in Hualien on the second day. And I had only planned, my ticket was only for four days. So he took me to a pretty lousy hotel. At least it served the purposes for the night. So flash forward 21 years and I watched my brother coming from Hawaii, more or less just as I did, even though I went to Japan and came from Japan to here. And he came with two containers full of household goods and watching him unpack and sort for the last several weeks has been an eye-opener. He has so many things. Unbelievable. And here I have been thinking recently that I perhaps had too much. I've always wanted to slim down. I came with two suitcases and I've managed to accumulate enough things to mostly fill a four bedroom apartment, including my beautiful wonderful wife. It seems that I accumulated a lot. And it's interesting because when I moved to Bualien from from 
Where was it? Chilong. <laughs> Thank you. From Chilong to Hualien, four years ago, I had moved from a place almost as large as probably a square foot of what I have now to a tiny bit of studio. So I had gotten rid of everything. But here I again sit accumulating as much, if not more, than I had previously. So accumulation, even when the appeal, the Zen sensibility, the Zen living style, Japanese living style, with a few strategically, carefully placed things, really appealed to me. Minimalism. But when there's two of you, things change. You need things, it seems. You may not want them, but you seem to need them. And they do have a way of accumulating quickly. But looking at my uh, brother and while enjoying him, enjoying the fact that he's in the process of moving here and that his wonderful wife, Tisha, will join him and will be living in the same city is a great and wonderful occurrence for me. I had begun by visualizing the possibility that as he reached retirement age, as he decided that he couldn't keep up the daily grind of trying to make it in Hawaii, which is getting increasingly more crowded, increasingly more expensive, that they might consider moving here. Well, it came to fruition over the last two years. And that makes me smile. But again, things. And as you travel up the mountain, if that's a visualization that suits you, on your spiritual journey, with the intent to somehow get to the pinnacle. As you take step by step in your journey, I was reminded recently that each step in and of itself is sacred. The entire mountain is sacred, not just the peak. The entire journey is sacred. And all we have to do is be willing to take the next step. You have to engage in this process. You have to accept responsibility. I think this is really the beginning of us. Accept responsibility for your own journey. No one is going to give it to you. No one can tap 
your forehead and you awaken by some miracle. You can't leave it in the hands of others. Even though the others include people that have managed, that have persevered, that have surrendered, and that have embraced the oneness available to all of us. Even though they've done their own journey, if you listen carefully, you'll hear their message that they can point the way they can help you establish a firm foundation. They're living examples. And they aspire to be no more than that. because they have to avoid the trap of being caught in the spiritual ego which has to be dealt with after abiding, after permanent awakening have to be on guard, vigilant that the spiritual ego, the mantle of a guru that to be worshipped as a God on earth is alluring and perhaps the last temptation. This last temptation is there for everyone that has reached or is closing in on the transition from non-abiding, progressive awakening to abiding or permanent awakening. There is this last temptation. And some people unfortunately get stuck there. So, at what point do you start needing less? <laughs> I've been at this point for a long time. I always feel like I need less as I accumulated more. So where is that fine line between responsible participation in life as it finds you, irregardless of where you are on your spiritual journey, your inquiry, your search for lack of a better word. And it seems to me that the secret of wanting less, which I have been growing to understand, is giving more. As you find yourself giving more, giving more of yourself, giving more of your presence, giving more of your time, as you walk away from desiring as you walk away from 
judgment. This giving more. is where progress is being made on wanting less. Here we go again. Polarities, opposites, wanting more, giving more. And it's in the process that that you give more, then you start to understand what's truly important. And part of this balance between giving more and getting more is an understanding of a universal truth. And it should propel you onto the path of not only giving more and wanting less, but reconciling. The beginning is the law of the abundance, law of abundance. Whatever you want, you give. And as you see, as you perceive that there's no lack of, the law of abundance means that everything is infinitely available. So, why do you need to accumulate when you know that everything is in abundance? And that when you truly need something, you need something to sustain your physical presence, which indeed is your responsibility as long as you're in the body. As long as you have the gift of this body, it's your responsibility to sustain, to maintain, to nurture this gift of the human form. Your responsibility, only yours. There are no free rides in this universe. So the, start out by giving more, and you'll find that within the seed of giving more comes the lessening of desire, of wanting more. Understanding the law of abundance will clearly show you that clinging, craving desires are not only counterproductive, but border on the destructive. Craving more than is necessary for your maintenance of the human form, accumulating more, is a disease, much as we can see that rich people always want to get richer. They want more and more and more, and they experience less and less satisfaction of what they have because the desire to get more is all-consuming. And people who might feel like they're getting close, they never feel like they've acquired enough monies, enough riches, but as they get close, then power becomes their temptation, their, the seeds of their next craving, because with wealth, power is not close behind, is close behind, so they're almost hand in hand. 
But the point is the craving, the accumulation, and power in many ways is a more vicious mistress than acquisition of money. The desire for increasing power is a rocky path that only leaves, leads to unhappiness for many. So to come back to giving more. We watch people who have accumulated a lot and they reach their phase. Bill Gates comes to mind. Although I'm still not convinced that what he's doing is completely selfless because he remains the second richest man in the world. And doesn't seem likely, even though he's lauded for his generosity, for his giving. It's only the huge growth of Amazon that he's been displaced as the world's richest man. And he could give money, a lot more money than he is currently giving. But the desire, he hasn't been giving enough. He needs to give more. And it's not always your material goods, it's giving of yourself, which begins by, number one, recognizing that the self is a illusory construct developed by tradition, developed by society, that's an outside influence which comes to flavor your thinking of who you really are. The process of surrendering this structure that as you age, as you mature, you are active participant, you're vested in this illusion, in this maya. You see yourself and you see the others. But in the process of losing your self, or at least your self-importance, in the hopes that self, <laughs> that you'll go past the need for self. At least self-importance. And this is through bhakti yoga, devotion, goodness, the love of your heart, the wanting to help the wanting to do your part, no matter how small, into making the condition of your brothers and sisters, of all that share the same reality as you do, that are all expressions of this oneness. Within this oneness is great diversity look around and appreciate, pause, breathe, reflect, study. And the giving process, and like everything else, we all have our own particular and unique abilities. So is giving. Giving is no different than any other aspect of 
our individualized form. We have our own way of forgiving. And at least in my situation, it started by forgiving. It starts with forgiving those that seem to be the other, seem to be on the outside, seem to be part of the world around you. Forgive them for their transgressions. And in forgiveness, don't forget to forgive yourself. I continue this process on a daily basis by reciting my simple mantra, I am a better man today than I was yesterday, and I'll be a better man tomorrow than I am today. And I say this as only a reminder, knowing that there was no yesterday, and there is no tomorrow, there is only now. But as we sit in the present moment, that helps me to get past any failures that I might have had in the moment, any time that I was less than what I knew I could be. So this forgiveness of others begins with forgiveness of yourself. And it needs to be practiced continually. Because I've mentioned before, karma accumulates. As long as we're in the physical form, we're accumulating karma. You might have your way of dealing with it. I have my way of the all-consuming. Flame. The violet consuming flame, which I place consciously accumulated karma from a daily basis and let it burn. So it's this forgiveness that allows, that nurtures, that creates the environment necessary to give, to give more and more. Selfless giving without seeking or expecting appreciation or accumulating any kind of points for Good karma, <laughs> because karma is interesting. Good karma, bad karma, but essentially they're both the same, good or bad. The accumulation will have results that will ultimately hinder your surrender. So uh, this selfless giving, this bhakti, bhakti yoga, this devotion, this self selfless service, this devotion to unity, unity of all. It's hard to feel very important when you understand that we're all equally as important. We're all part of the same divine energy, the divine light. This is where ordinariness, when you start to embrace the beauty of what it is to be ordinary, an ordinary human being, 
has embraced the universal, is living in the moment because there is truly nothing else. And wanting more, even wanting this spiritual heritage, this awakening process, can have its roots in desire or wanting. And at some point, you see that this is counterproductive, that you have to retire this desire as well, even though it seems it's harder to see that desires that are aimed to an ultimate, appear to be aimed at an ultimate good purpose, are more insidious and more difficult at times to overcome than the more obvious desires that lead to accumulation. And it gets to the point, as you understand what is available to all of us, if they only remember, if they remember their condition, if they remember their unity, if they forget concepts of division, separation, longing, jealousies, as they forget the things that limit you on your journey to the top of the sacred mountain where you discover that you've always known this peace that what you really were longing for was this sense of wholeness. What you were really look, longing for is the acceptance that we all are but reflections of that spirit, of that unity. When you get to the point giving more, understanding that we work in a world of abundance, giving more doesn't mean that you're giving up anything. Giving more means that you have security of knowing that whatever you need for sustenance, for maintenance is there for you.